todo mundo. Vamos iniciar, então, nosso, nosso evento do dia de hoje. Bom dia! Bom dia, Vietnã. Lembram-se do Robin Williams? Nossa escola de primavera. Vamos, caração, vamos fazer algo muito interessante hoje. Vamos começar. Lembre-se, ontem nós começamos a nossa escola de primavera uh, com várias universidades juntos. A Universidade de Salem, com a palestra do Sérgio, da Universidade. Lembre-me, por favor, uh, quais foram... As pessoas que estávamos aqui ontem, Mônaco, França, muitas partes do mundo, o Brasil também está muito bem representado aqui. Temos a Universidade Federal do Ceará e a Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina do Brasil. Muito bem representado. E a Universidade de Algarve, com a professora Esther Serrão e Luiz Santos. Muito bem lembrado. Estiveram aqui, foi apresentações realmente extraordinárias. E, e também um, assistimos a um, um filme muito interessante, interessante vindo do Chile a respeito das calças. E hoje nós estamos também muito bem. Uh, de, de, desejo a vocês um ótimo dia, uma, ótimas apresentações e desfrutem das palestras. Eu vou fechar a minha câmera agora, mas estarei aqui, atrás das câmeras. Obrigada, Paulo. Bom dia, meu nome é Giovana, sou uma estudante de mestrado na, em Oceanografia, na Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. Gostaria de lembrar... Geography at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. Uh, and just to remind you that this year we have united two events. The fourth, Fortaleza Austro Spring School. And the second, Floripa Spring International Eco School in Susten Sustainability. Um, This morning, we will learn and discuss about marginal reefs, blue carbon, talks. Uh, I will present Dr. Martina Copari. She is a researcher and a lecturer at the Polytechnic University of Marche in Ancona, Italy. Her interest is focus on the trophic and reproductive ecology of benthic suspension feeders and she's also interested in mon monitor of the effects of climate change and anthropic activities on benthic communities to foster marine conservation strategies so martina you can start good morning and good afternoon everyone Uh, my name is uh, Martina Copari, and um, uh, I think you have to give me again the, the permission. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're good. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm. First of all, I would like to thank the, the organizers uh, to invite me to this event and to give me the possibility to present uh, some na floresta ma animal marinha e também aspectos de biologia, de tecnologia de diferentes espécies. Gostaria de começar com uma introdução breve. Uh, animal florestais marinhos uh, de respeito das espécies bênticas como corais, esponjas e gongrônias, espécies que criam ambientes complexos e tridimensionais. A presença da floresta uh, 
marinha define as condições do meio ambiente especial a, a, a floresta reduz a suspensão e aumenta a disponibilidade de alimentos assim como a estabilidade do substrato. Por todos esses motivos, muitas espécies vivem associadas com essas florestas, encontram na floresta uh, fontes de alimento e também vivem nessas florestas, utilizando a floresta como áreas de refúgio. Por esse motivo, os animais, florestas de animais marinhos têm uma alta gama de biodiversidade e a maior parte desta biodiversidade é associada a importâncias comerciais. E... Um, marine animal forest sustain a high level of biodiversity and uh, most of the time this associated uh, biodiversity as also a um, commercial importance. Indeed, um, a marine animal forests could, could support uh, fishing activities, and therefore providing um, benefits for the humankind, the so-called ecosystem services. But uh, due to the complexity and the three-dimensional structures and the biodiversity associated, as well as the incredible colors of uh, this environment, uh, the um, marine animal forest could also support tourism and um, leisure and recreational activities, such as diving, diving activity or snorkeling, for instance. Um, but um, another um, important and crucial uh, ecosystem services uh, provided by, uh, by uh, this marine animal forest is um, defined as blue carbon. And blue carbon, blue carbon is normally uh, referred to the uh, capability of coastal and vegetal um, environment to um, store and retain carbon in the sediment. And um, The definition blue carbon normally refers to um, particular environment ecosystems such as tidal marshes, mangrove ecosystems or seagrass meadows. But recently, um, the terms blue carbon have been um, used also for other ecosystems and uh, marine animal forest uh, could be one of these, um, of these ecosystems. Indeed, the presence of um, of the forest could um, could uh, modify could um, increase the uh, circulation of carbon and um, and um, could modify the um, the carbon flux and um, the presence of the forest could um, 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 could be actively um, part of the benthic pelagic coupling processes. And if you uh, focus on this um, part of this picture, which uh, um, represent, uh, this image represent the um, uh, schematic view of the benthic pelagic coupling, um, you see here a muscle belt, which is um, also, uh, which is uh, an example of a marine animal forest. And uh, uh, the presence of this muscle belt uh, could, um, could um, you know, being suspension feeder, the muscles could uh, capture uh, the particle present in the water column and uh, um, With their uh, nutrient uh, excretion, the, with the nutrient excretion, they fed the uh, microbial food web. And at the same time, muscles during reproduction produce larvae or gametes that fed other organisms, such as fishes or um, other pelagic organisms, and so um, directly uh, support uh, the, um, the trophic chain uh, through different pathways and. Um, participating in the benthic pelagic capping, so connecting the two realms, the pelagic and the benthic realms. But um, a part of the capping, 
hormone that is assimilated, that is uh, provided by the food, uh, is also used by the benthic organisms uh, to uh, increase in size and to directly build uh, tissues or uh, living structure, uh, organic skeleton, etc. So we talk about carbon immobilization. And uh, um, in this figure, in this image, you see a, a schematic view of um, how this carbon, uh, how this flux of carbon could be immobilized um, in the uh, benthic species. This is an example, this figure refers to a polar um, environment, but could also um, be used to explain the situation in uh, temperate, um, temperate ecosystems. Indeed, in spring, after the algal bloom, uh, there is um, also a, a, the, the plankton bloom, which is directly fed on, al on algae. And both algae and the plankton could reach um, the benthic, the seabed, and be eaten by uh, benthic organisms. And this uh, um, uh, this energy provided by both phytoplankton and zooplankton is used by uh, benthic organisms to grow and to uh, increase in size. And therefore, once um, uh, this living structure and this tissue have been uh, built, the, the carbon used to um, build the living structure is therefore immobilized for uh, years, for um, centuries, or depending on the species, also for millennia. There is also another uh, smaller portion of carbon that could be uh, completely sequestered and buried uh, in the sediment. And um, this is a smaller portion because the carbon, to, to be sequestered, the carbon should um, rapidly um, sink uh, to the seabed and being quickly buried before being degraded by bacteria or uh, by other organisms. So this is why this is a smaller quantity compared to the other. And uh, uh, I am going to focus in this presentation on this um, component of the carbon, the carbon that has been immobilized, in particular in three uh, different uh, species of Gorgonian, three uh, Mediterranean Gorgonian species. And um, I'm going to uh, explain how uh, this uh, carbon invested for growth, so how, the, the, how you could measure and estimate the carbon, um, the carbon um, immobilization. So here I simplify the step that I performed to uh, reach this estimate in these three uh, Gorgonian species. So first of all, uh, I selected uh, the species and I uh, measure the carbon ingestion. You have to consider that the carbon ingestion could be either um, uh, via autotrophy, uh, which means that the uh, organisms, gorgonians, for instance, as um, bacteria or algae as symbionts inside their uh, tissues, and uh, the symbionts provide energy through uh, photosynthesis, but, um, but gorgonians and filter feedings in general could also um, rely on the particles uh, present in the water column for their um, provision of energy. In this case, we talk about heterotrophy. Um, some organisms could use both the feeding strategy, both, both the trophic strategies, and so we talk about mixotrophy. Of course, uh, you have to consider both the components, both the feeding strategy, when you want to um, obtain uh, an estimate of the carbon, of the total carbon ingestion. Then you have to measure the amount of carbon that is respired by the colonies and the carbon that is invested in reproduction for the, produ for, um, the production of um, oocytes, gametes in general, or larvae to measure the carbon that is invested for growth, which is the real uh, carbon that is immobilized and that uh, could last for um, different years or centuries. So uh, measuring the uh, carbon uh, for growth, invested in growth, is the easiest approach to estimate the amount of carbon that has been captured and immobilized. And you can 
estimate uh, the, the growth of a colony or, or a species in general, either by photosampling. In this uh, picture, you can see how uh, the same specimen has been, from, um, has been photographed in different uh, time, time lapse. And so uh, you can see how and how much it has been grown. And um, another approach to measure the growth of a colony could be uh, we, uh, through the photogrammetry. And uh, photogrammetry uh, rely on the, the construction of 3D models. And, um, and here you can see, for instance, that uh, the red tips is the, um, the, the point of the, uh, of the colony that, uh, that grow uh, the most. Actually, this model is, um, is made in a sponges. It's not, uh, for a in a, it's not made in a Gorgonian, but I just put this video here to show how uh, two different uh, methodology could be used to reach the same objective, um, that is the measuring the, um, the growth rate. And, um, so here, um, here there is the, the publication about the, these three Gorgonian species and the quantification of the blue carbon. This uh, study was performed in, um, in the Cap de Creus area, which is in Spain, and the Northwestern Mediterranean Sea. And three species have been selected, uh, two, um, namely Leptogorgia sarmentosa and Paramuricea clamata, are uh, completely uh, heterotroph, which means that they are only suspension feeders. They rely on the uh, particles present in the water column for their feeding. And this species has uh, uh, different uh, habits uh, um, and um, live in different um, could share the same uh, habitat or could live in different uh, communities. For instance, Paramulicea clavata uh, prefer uh, vertical and platform coralligenous assemblages to live, uh, whilst Leptogorgia sarmentosa could, could live in pre-coralligenous coralligenous assemblages, but also in a photophilic environment and um, also in detritic and coarse sand uh, bottom. Uh, the last species uh, that was considered in this study is Eunicella singularis. Um, this species uh, could live um, uh, from uh, 0 to one, uh, 100 meter depth, but in this, in this study we considered uh, the depth range from 0 to 70 meter. And um, what could be observed is that this species is mixotroph um, from zero to uh, around 40 meter depth. And uh, below this, uh, um, this depth, this species is only heterotroph. So when um, you, you, you have to measure, you have to quantify the carbon ingestion for the shallower specimen, you have also to consider the um, the contribution of the autotroph um, of the, um, the symbionts, the zooxantelle, that are present in the tissue of this uh, species. Uh, Eunicella singularis uh, mostly live in pre-coralligenous and coralligenous assemblages. So after the selection of the species, I made a, a literature review and I found uh, 15 uh, publications uh, that um, were um, useful um, uh, for the, this purpose of quantifying the carbon immobilization. And uh, I could obtain uh, with this publication data on uh, the carbon ingestion, respiration, the carbon invested in growth, and also data on the spatial distribution of these th three species. Uh, if you um, consider that um, these species, uh, these three species, Species are among the most well studied species in the Mediterranean Sea. There are several publications uh, related with ecology and biology of these species, but data on the carbon um, invested for the reproduction, for the, um, uh, the production of uh, uh, gametes and larvae is not available at present. So if this is the situation for well studied species you can already imagine uh, which is this uh, what is the scenario for uh, rare species or for uh, deeper species 
uh, where um, there is uh, um, uh, most of the data are still lacking. Um, in this study, uh, um, a methodology that is normally used in um, land uh, for the study of landscape uh, ecology was applied in um, for the study of marine uh, animal forest. Indeed, uh, um, uh, remote sensing technique could be used uh, to estimate the extension of uh, uh, land forest or uh, crops and uh, um, and in the same way, in marine uh, ecosystems, you can use remote operated vehicles or ROV, um, ROV or uh, autonomous operated vehicles, to study uh, the distribution of um, some species or um, entire animal forest and also to um, reconstruct the um, seascape and the um, eventually the uh, Benti cartography. And uh, um, here you can see uh, a detail of the Cap de Creus area, and grey uh, bullets represent the 76 transects performed with ROV um, that have been analyzed by video analysis, and uh, through this uh, um, analysis I can obtain I could obtain the spatial and mathematical distribution of these three species as well as their population size structure. But with ROV it is also possible to estimate the um, the amount of um, substrate uh, that is suitable for the three species. For instance, if you know that um, para Murisea clavata normally lives on um, vertical and platform coral legions. You can estimate the hectares um, covered by this kind of assemblages uh, through the um, through um, assembling performed with ROV. So um, with uh, um, with this video transect analysis, we obtain also the uh, benthic cartography of the area. And here you can see a flow chart summarizing all the steps that I performed to um, obtain, to finally obtain a, a quantity of carbon, a potential carbon immobilized by uh, these three Gorgonia species. So if um, starting from the the carbon flux that was uh, measured uh, by the difference from the ingestion and the respiration rate, this carbon flux was measured first in all the colonies that have been observed uh, in the video transect. For this uh, same colonies, uh, we also calculated the biomass, considering the uh, ash free dry weight uh, per centimeter. And uh, combining uh, the biomass and um, the biomass of the observed colonies with the uh, substrate uh, available, the, the available, the suitable substrate for all the, the colonies, I could estimate both the potential biomass and a potential carbon flux in the study area. In the same way, I measured the uh, potential carbon immobilization. I started with the growth rate uh, calculated in the observed um, uh, colonies, observed from the video uh, analysis, and then I coupled this data with the potential number of colonies pre present in the, in the study area, obtaining the potential carbon immobilization in the Cap de Creus area. Another, um, another way, another method to, um, to obtain a large scale quantification of the blue carbon is um, uh, the, the, the use of the species distribution models that are statistical models um, uh, that um, are based on the uh, on data on species abundance and environmental and topographic characteristic of the study area, combining these two, da two, two data, you can obtain a full coverage predictive map of distribution and also of, uh, the, of abundance of the species. And if you uh, combine um, 
the data obtained with this model, with data of the, um, the carbon immobilization, you can also uh, see in the map the areas that are um, that present the higher amount of carbon immobilized. So you can use this map, this predictive map, as a tool to uh, protect uh, and manage uh, some, um, some areas in particular. And uh, um, from the, the results of this study, um, I obtained that the carbon immobilized in, the, in this area uh, by these three uh, species is um, as high as 1.50 multiplied by 10 to the power of 2 tons of carbon per hectare per year. This quantity if you compare this quantity uh, with the carbon um, immobilization mediated by other ecosystems such as mangroves, Amazonian forest and seagrass meadow, you can see that our gorgonians uh, can immobilize to order of magnitude less carbon than the other three ecosystems. But you have also to consider that um, here in this study, we consider only three species in our, uh, in our real complex, complex um, coralligenous community. And if we could also have data of uh, the mobilization carbon mediated by the algae that could affirm the framework of the coralligenous, or add the data of other sponges, other bryozoans, and in general, the um, most abundant species that live associated uh, with uh, the forest, uh, that live and uh, create the forest, uh, I am uh, more then sure that this data, um, this carbon immobilized will increase and could be, um, might be comparable with uh, these other um, ecosystems. ...de sua biologia e ecologia, mas o que acontece com espécies que são mais no fundo do mar, por exemplo, aqui coloquei alguns exemplos é, da minha pesquisa de pós-doutorado, do resultado da minha pesquisa de pós-doutorado, que eu foquei é, nesses nessas espécies aqui do slide. Então, são de 40 metros a 160 metros de profundidade, essas espécies criam florestas extensas e densas. Dense and extend, extended uh, forests, uh, both multi-specific forests. Um, these corals could live together with gorgonians, for instance, or um, could create forests uh, with um, different black corals um, in, the, in the same, could, could be multi-specific black corals forest. But sometimes they also create um, a, a single species forest. And uh, um, so it com considering that uh, they can dominate uh, the deeper community, the mesophotic community, it will be interesting to have also information of the amount of ca or carbon mobilized by these species. And uh, another important uh, um, characteristic of these species is the, um, the long lifespan. Indeed, uh, Leopatis glaberrima is one of the most long-lived species known so far. And uh, um, in uh, three studies, uh, it has been uh, dated the age of uh, Leopatis glaberrima, and two studies found that the species could live more than 2,000 years and one study uh, found that could live more than uh, 4,000 years. So in this case, if we could know the amount of, quantity, the amount of carbon that is immobilized um, by these species, we are also sure that this, this carbon is immobilized for uh, millennia. And uh, um, I, uh, during my postdoc, I focus my um, study on the ecology in particular of the species, that is Antipatella supinata, which is the, the shallower uh, black coral species in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, uh, I just 
started to, to, um, to study some aspect of its uh, biology, such as the diet that has been studied with um, uh, the stable isotope analysis. And also I, um, I uh, described some aspect of the asexual reproduction of the species. In particular, through uh, fragmentation, and also uh, I described uh, in Aquaria the uh, bailout uh, phenomenon in the species. And uh, um, what is interesting is that um, although these two uh, asexual reproduction strategy has been uh, observed only in Aquaria, it is likely that this uh, fragmentation or the production of bailout propagules could also happen in natural uh, environment. So what could be the fate of this fragment? Imagine that um, if the, uh, the fragment could immediately attach and start growing as fast as it happened in Aquaria, it could immediately become a, a carbon mobilizer. But if um, in the uh, natural environment the fragment is not able to attach as fast as in aquaria, it could be uh, in the benthic pelagic cavity um, uh, eaten by other organisms by bacteria, so um, um, entering the benthic pelagic cuppings and uh, circulate carbon again. And the same happened with bailout. Uh, bailout is a process um, that happened uh, in um, really stressful condition in aquaria, and uh, it is the active detachment of polyps, uh, of, um, of one uh, single polyp or uh, several polyps, that uh, completely changed um, their morphology, became ciliated, they start moving, and uh, um, uh, uh, what happened with these uh, propagules? Uh, as similar, uh, similarly to uh, the fragment, these, uh, um, these propagules could immediately um, settle, adhere to a new uh, substrata and become a new colony and be carbon uh, immobilizer, or could be um, could be eaten by fishes or by other organisms entering uh, the benthic pelagic coupling. So I um, I uh, focused also on black coral species just to light the um, the problem that is behind the uh, lack of data for uh, species that are deeper on that are less studied because um, there are logistic constraints to study the species and uh, because they are um, they are considered and um, so uh, to, to conclude and to uh, just give you some uh, take home message, uh, I can uh, summarize that uh, marine animal forests may immobilize a high quantity of carbon in their living structure. And this carbon immobilization could last for years, centuries, or even millennia, as in the case of uh, the black coral and the claberrima. There is a urgent need to study the ology of the species to understand their, contrib their contribution as carbon immobilizer. And uh, marine animal forest should be preserved to maintain the ecosystem service as carbon immobilizer, but also as um, to maintain the ecosystem service of provision of uh, biodiversity, uh, fishing, um, the provision of uh, um, the, the sustainment of fish activities and tourism. We also need to restore damaged marine animal forest uh, to um, to recover their role in uh, as carbon immobilizer, and we also need to protect to protect pristine marine animal forest and also mm, the unknown animal for the unknown animal forest. And with unknown, I mean um, forest that are. Um, that uh, we are just um, starting to study, but we still don't know how much they could contribute. And so in the mitigation of the um, carbon dioxide produced by anthropic activities. And uh, with this, I concluded and I really would like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Martina. It was wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now, I think we can follow. We will move to the Marcelo's talk. I'm right, Giovanna? Yes, Marcelo did send you the... the yes, he did. Are you with us, Marcelo? Let's do it. Yes. So Let's do it. I will, <laughs> I will use this moment to reinforce the need to, well, please, put your brain to warm right now. Write your questions in our chat. Even in Portuguese, in the room in Portuguese we have, you can write in Portuguese. Você pode, então, escrever sua questão em português. That que nós vamos fazer a tradução aqui. That we're going to make the translation here. So, oh, no, I will present for you, of course. Um, <laughs> can you introduce Professor Marcelo Giovanna, please? Sure. Uh, so, Professor Marcelo... Uh, obtained his PhD in ge geological sciences at Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. And now he works as a teacher at Federal University of Ceará, coordinates a research group in oceanography and the uh, our chief scientist in environment of the gov government of Ceará gathering science with public policy in the tropical marine environments, by plastics, Belgi Costa Semiarida of Brazil, and Brass Core Research Network. His research topics include marine biodiversity, ocean and coastal conservation, climate change, coral reefs, and mangroves. So, Marcelo. The floor is yours. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I will be behind the cameras again. Okay, okay. The, uh, thank you, Giovanna, for the presentation. Uh, it's a great challenge to talk after Martina. She done a very nice talk. And this is my time now <laughs> to do this work. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say some few words that I am very, very happy to participate in this international school. Especially, I would like to thank Professor Paulo Horta and Professor Sergio Rossi for organizing this international school with many friends from Italy, Monaco, Cyprus, and other countries around the world. Okay, I, uh, the sound and Im image is okay, uh, Giovanna. If you have some problem, you talk to me. No, it's uh, fine. So it's I fine. Oh, it's fine. Okay, okay. I will talk here a little about the marginal reefs today, né? or if you can say extreme reefs. Okay. And next, Paulo. So, uh, Martina talked about the marine animal forest. This is very interesting uh, theme that is talked in a very recent book. Uh, Paulo, please, next image. Uh, you can see on these photographs a coral reef, okay, with uh, the reef features, the corals, the brazoans, the ascidians, and a very interesting forest with the birds. And Professor Sergio Rossi led two different books, uh, the first one in 2017, Marine Animal Forest, and the most recent, please, Paulo, next, uh, that talk about the uh, perspective on the distinct marine animal forests of the world. One of the most interesting, richest ecosystems of the world are the coral reefs. Please, Paulo, next. You can see that around the world we have very nice, interesting uh, coral reefs, especially in tropical regions. Uh, Paulo, uh, perfect. You can see in this beautiful photograph uh, a coral reef, a typical coral reef, and maybe some teacher in the high school or in the university, like the Mr. Simpson, uh, define a concept about the coral reefs. Please, Paulo, next. And maybe this professor, maybe Professor Paulo Orta or Professor Sergio Ross, or just me, <laughs> talk that uh, 
drop coral reefs occur and thrive in clear, shallow, and oligotrophic waters with a narrow temperature range. This is the most uh, simple and common concept to define the tropical coral reefs around the world. We call in this presentation this kind of marine ecosystem like a traditional, traditional coral reefs, okay? This is the most uh, recognized concept around the world. Paulo, please, please the next slide. So, maybe Sergio talked yesterday and other guys will talk today and tomorrow about the cornerstone of the coral reef ecosystem. And of course, it's the symbiosis between the coral, the host, and the endosymbiont, that is the microalgae. To maintain and persist this partnership is the very important that we have the optimal conditions, especially for the traditional coral reefs. And what are optimal conditions? We need to have low nutrient content, adequate pH levels, adequate uh, light, of course, for the photosymbiosis, for the photosynthesis, especially of, especially of the microalgae, the water transparency, okay, and a lower SST variability. SST is the sea surface uh, temperature. These are the optimal conditions. Optimal conditions for what? Uh, please, next slide, uh, Paulo. Optimal conditions, especially for the geoecological functions. Tomorrow, my friend from Mexico, Lorenzo Alvarez Filippi, you talk a little about this. Né? Uh, he is a great expert in these geoecological functions. We can talk, for example, uh, some of these geoecological functions, such as the carbonate growth, the production of sediments, okay, the cementation and lithification. And these are very important ecological, geoecological functions of coral reefs. And to this positive carbonate production, we need this symbiosis, especially for reef growth. Uh, please follow the next slide. But now we are on the Anthropocene era, okay, that we are uh, having a fast change uh, about the environmental conditions of the oceans, especially in the tropical coasts. Uh, Paul, next slide. And it's uh, very interesting to see that the environmental conditions are changing and driving the coral bleaching. That, of course, most of you know this process and you have different conditions. For example, uh, higher temperatures, the continental, and urban runoff with increased pollution levels, some changes on the solar irradiation and other process, including microplastics that are driving uh, a higher frequency and intensity of bleaching events. Next slide, Paulo, please. And if you have a persistent stress, of course, Unfortunately, we have higher uh, mortality levels of corals that are our trees in the marine animal forests. And maybe we need to change a little bit this concept of the, of the professor, Mr. Simpson, <laughs> in this slide. We have a changing environment. We are changing the optimal conditions that the traditional coral reefs evolved along the time to the suboptimal conditions. For example, uh, please, Paulo, the clear waters are, are becoming more turbid with uh, increased sediment levels. And this is a problem because they have suspension of sediments, for example, by the deforestation of the forests, uh, the tropical forests, for example, here in Brazil, the Amazon forest, the Atlantic forest, is increasing the levels, the sediment levels, and the turbidity on the waters. The next, Paulo, the shallow, the shallow conditions are also changing. 
né? Aqui, é, here you can see some example of the changing of the cost of development and runoff that is changing the sedimentation. Uh, next, Paul. The shallow, for example, the shallow environment that many of the coral reefs evolved is also changing by the uh, sea level rise that is, of course, driving by, by the climate change. And uh, next, Paul. Most of the coral reefs around the world will not have a higher uh, fast growth rates to, uh, to track this uh, rapid sea level rise. And next, Paul, another change is in the oligotrophic waters. The oligotrophic water is also changing by the increasing of pollution. For example, in this very nice art, uh, in the PNAS, we can find the mass mortality during the dead zones, the lower uh, levels of oxygen in the marine waters. Please follow the next. And, and the other very uh, no change on the environment, of course, is the global warming. That is changing the temperature range where the tradition, traditional coral reefs evolved. Please follow the next. Not only the prolonged and long-lasting uh, global warming, but also the marine heat waves that is increasing in frequency and intensity. And this is a very, very big problem to the conservation to coral reefs around the world. Please, Paulo, next. And uh, maybe Professor Simpson may call uh, the heat zone now in the Anthropocene. And this is a schema, schematic overview of the marine animal forest, and we are changing. For example, the Scleractinia corals that are the most important reef building species in the traditional coral reefs are changing for other groups. For example, please, Paulo, next slide. We have the rise of other organisms, such as the flesh, flesh macroalgae, the octocorals, for example, the zoantarians, zoantarians, and the sponges. These mo some species are thriving and increasing in many distinct uh, traditional coral reefs around the world. Please, Paulo, next example. We can see on this article of the Professor Sergio Rossi that talk about the trophic ecology that uh, Professor Giorgio Mantinelli, you call, you, you talk a little bit in the next presentation. Please follow the next slide. And we can see that the conditions are changing for the traditional coral reefs. But, however, we do not have only the traditional coral reefs. We have other reef ecosystems worldwide. For example, a growing research in many seas of a rise or, or the wide are changing this reef paradigm that Professor Mr. Simpson talked uh, to the students. For example, we have a research in Caribbean Sea and Coral Triangle, Australia, South Atlantic, Red Sea, Northwestern Pacific, Kuroshio region, Mozambique, in the Persian Arabian Gulf, that is the hottest, the most hot sea in, in the world with higher natural temperature levels. Please, next slide, Professor Paulo. That are changing the paradigm. And we found around the world extreme coral reefs or marginal reefs that naturally occurring in these extreme conditions. For for example, extreme temperatures, uh, turbid waters naturally occur in turbid waters due to the suspension of sediments, energetic environment, the presence of the large rivers. And next, Paulo, other, other marginal reefs or extreme reefs, for example, extreme pH, uh, places that naturally occur in extreme pH that is predicted due to the ocean acidification on the next decades, especially for traditional coral And also the mesophotic ecosystems, the mesophotic reefs 
that are rich that occur in a higher depth than the shallow water traditional coral reefs. Please, the next slide, Paulo. And, and what, how we can define the marginal reefs? Now, we can define uh, the marginal reefs for two main assumptions. The first one, marginal reefs can be defined as marine cities developed in hard bottoms that survive under marginal or suboptimal conditions. Of course, this is a concept that considers the environmental conditions. The envir environment is the main, uh, main aspect of this definition. Of course, this has been done for the terrestrial forest. For example, we have the dry lands né, or the, the the forest, for example, and under higher precipitation, for example, the Amazonian forest. And the second definition is the marginal communities may all strive on hard substrates, such as intertidal or subtidal rock reefs, is to even in storing habitats and rhodolith beds that Professor Paulo uh, worked a lot on, on this research area. Please, the next, Professor Paulo. And this is a very, very uh, interesting uh, theme to study now about the, the marine animal forest. This is one of the chapters that we published on this book of the Professor Sergio Ross, edited with the Lorenzo, Professor Lorenzo Bramanti. The next slide. Uh, in this map, we can see the occurrence of marginal reefs around the world. For example, the hot seas, the mass of arctic environments, the reefs in upwelling zones, the high latitudinal reefs, and the turbid reefs. That, for, for example, in Brazil, we have the turbid zone that is naturally, naturally occurring in moderate turbid waters. Please, Paulo, next slide. This is a natural occurrence. In this, in this slide, we can see a figure that is, was on the book chapter that we recently published. For example, we have the distinct environmental settings that drive the community of mesophotic environments, the high temperature environments, the turbidity, the upwelling, and even the high latitude, high latitude uh, reefs. For example, uh, please the next slide, Paulo. And for example, one of these marginal reefs that is under a growing and intense debate around the world are the mesophotic coral ecosystems. Né? In this article on the science of total environment, we agreed about the importance to conserve this kind of unique ecosystem. Please, next slide, Paulo. For example, this is the distribution of mesophotic coral ecosystems around the world. In this article, we mapped some of the points. We see that is a natural system that uh, including occurring a lot here in the Western Atlantic, in the Caribbean Sea and Brazil. Uh, next slide, Paulo. Uh, the mesophotic coral ecosystem uh, naturally occurring between the depth between the 30 meters and 150 meters depth. We have a, this tiwi light zone where we have a decrease in the light levels. But we found uh, sclerotinias, for example, and other organisms that do the photosynthesis and sustain, support a higher biodiversity, including endemic species. Maybe Professor Hudson Pinheiro will talk tomorrow about this system, that it is a very good and nice expert in this kind of ecosystem. Please, Paulo, next. For example, this is a, a beautiful photograph from Joana Boa Vida in Portugal about a temperate mesophot ecosystem in the coast of Portugal. Next slide, Paulo, please. And, but, but these ecosystems are under growing 
impacts. We, uh, usually we talk only about the impacts on the shallow water, traditional coral reefs. But we are uh, also, these kind of ecosystems are under uh, a human, increasing human pressure. And we have the uh, next slide, follow please. In this article, we talk about the impacts and the conservation strategies here in the South Atlantic, in Brazil, also in Africa, and in some of the Oceanic Islands. We cannot forget that this kind of ecosystems are under human pressures, such from the fishing activities, the invasive species, and also the climate change impacts. Next slide, Paulo, please. There is, there is a growing research worldwide about not only the mesophotic ecosystems, but other uh, marginal reefs, such as the vent sites and the, the E of this figure, uh, mangrove systems with the presence of corals, the intertidal reefs, and other kinds of the marginal reefs. Price. Essa é uma grande esponja nessa área. E você pode encontrar esse tipo de organismo naturalmente. Uh, corais uh, is, que não são vistos tão tradicionalmente na região de, tradicional de barreiras de corais. Nessa fotografia, que é em Fortaleza também, então, aqui você vê esponjas grandes, mas poucas espécies de corais. Uma que é uma espécie tolerante, que é It's a Cavern Coral, that, it's, que é encontrada no Mar do Caribe, também no Atlântico Sul, e também uma espécie que é a Siderastré, que é específica de águas turvas. Então, são dois tipos de corais resistentes às condições subideais, como turbidez e suspensão de segmentos. Aqui você vê a proporção entre as esponjas, e a Montestreia cavernosa e algas, também, que, uh, uh, grama, canteiro de algas, também que são os principais componentes, e E neste tipo, você encontra esponjas naturalmente ocorrendo em grande quantidade, neste tipo de zona de coral turvo. Este é um dos artigos que a gente publicou, que a gente fala sobre os recifes esquecidos, pois muitas vezes a gente esquece de sistemas extremos e diferenciados. Então, por que precisamos estudar os corais marginais? Eu vou lhes dar cinco razões principais para estudar esse tipo de sistema. O primeiro, hoje, os corais marginais, eles podem oferecer insights sobre outros uh, corais, como eles serão no futuro. Obviamente, não é, uh, um, não é algo comum no futuro, porém, podemos uh, encontrar aspectos interessantes nesses sistemas extremos de corais. A, a segunda razão é devido à diversidade única e ao seu endemismo, que realmente merece ser protegida, ser protegida por si. Nós encontramos nesses corais marginais um, altos níveis de M, é, altos níveis, pois eles se desenvolvem devido à seleção natural, selecionando espécies tolerantes e resistentes. O terceiro 
conhecer, o conceito de compreender é, o papel potencial que os suicídios marginais têm como refúgios universais, que é destacado nas pesquisas de conservação de recifes. Por exemplo, os sistemas, os sistemas mesofóticos estão sendo discutidos como sendo um refúgio para a mudança climática, um refúgio para os populares. A outra razão é devido ao conhecimento da estrutura, funcionamento e a resistência dos ecossistemas marinhos. Eles representam uma porção que não é muito analisada em relação à biodiversidade de corais em todos os, os mares. Não é tão estudada como os corais tradicionais. A discussão to be a some kind of climate change refugia. The next, Paulo, please. The other is knowledge of, of, of the structure, functioning and resistance of marine ecosystems, and they represent an overlooked portion of reef biodiversity. This kind of uh, reef systems are not well understood or a lot studied than the traditional coral reefs in the Caribbean Sea or in the Great Barrier Reef in the Australia. In the Australia, so we need to study more about the rotu reefs, the tubular reefs, the mesophotic coral ecosystems, and other kind of marginal reefs. The other, Paulo, please. Next slide. And uh, this, this the marginal reefs, such this expo could be in fact is uh, these reefs are distinct from the reefs under optimal conditions such as the traditional reefs. many studies around the world show that the functional diversity the taxonomic diversity and the phylogenetic diversity is distinct from the traditional coral reefs and this is very interesting to understand and develop the conservation strategies this kind of systems the next paul and we found two main core characteristics of the marginal reefs the first one the lower species richness and the second the dumbness of stress tolerant species these characteristics uh, lead to some concepts about the marginal reefs. Next, Paulo, please. And these uh, reefs are now under the spotlight due the probably the resistance to marine heat waves. For example, we found now on the traditional coral reefs a lower resistance with high higher bleaching rates and also higher mass mortality of corals. This usually occur in the optimal conditions, in the shallow water traditional coral reefs. But on the marginal reefs, such as the two design reefs, the high latitude reefs, the high temperature reefs, and also on the mesophotic coral ecosystems, we found corals with a higher resistance and of course, lower bleaching and lower coral mortality rates. And this is the main reason that these imaginal reefs are under intense discussion around the world. Next, Paulo, please. For example, this is a kind of beautiful and nice Brazilian coral reef. Uh, usually, we found fewer uh, species, and uh, massive species, some endemic species. And for example, we have uh, 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 just one branching coral, and the fact is a hydrocoral, the Milepora, this, that is uh, also known from the Caribbean Sea. This is a Brazilian reef, is this the only uh, branching coral? that provided a structural complexity to this kind of environment. So, but in the last two years, we have a higher mortality of this kind of the coral. Unfortunately, this is the only coral that suffer higher mortality rates after a higher bleaching rates here in Brazil. And of course, if we lost this kind of uh, coral, either coral, in this, in this case, Milepora, we lost its structural complexity of the reef. 
and with, with uh, re negative repercussions on the marine biodiversity, of, of, for example, on the reef fishes. The next, Paulo, please. This is the bathymetric distribution of the corals here in Brazil. We found a deeper uh, bathymetric range, or, or in other words, these corals usually uh, occur in deeper waters. We can see this on the schematic diagram on the next slide, please, Paulo, again, the next slide. We can find distinct characteristics that uh, Miguel Myers talked recently in one article. We found, for example, higher mortality and bleaching in the coral reefs of the Indo-Pacific and the Caribbean. But here on the South Atlantic, especially in Brazil, we found a distinct characteristic species, especially the massive corals with lower mortality rates after the bleaching events. Please, Paulo, the next slide. But these uh, ecosystems are under pressure. How uh, and with problems in the conservation. For example, in the case of mesophotic coral ecosystem. The next slide, Paulo, please. We talk uh, 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 about a deep reef refugia hypothesis. So we think that the corals in the mesophotic ecosystems are more protected from the heat waves, from the sedimentation, from the solar irradiation, and protected from the fishing pressure. So this leads to a hypothesis that is, that is called the refuge hypothesis. Please, the next, Paulo. But these, these kind of ecosystems, to act as a refugia site, we need to be protected. Of course, if this uh, kind of ecosystems is under intense pressure, they do not act as a refugia for your own biodiversity and also for other reefs. For, uh, for example, please, Paulo, please, uh, the next slide. For example, the mesophotic ecosystems have some characteristics that increase the vulnerability to human impacts. And this is very interesting to understand. And moreover, more of these reefs are not recognized by the, by, in the policy decisions or in the conservation strategies. And for example, most of the mesophotic ecosystems around the world are now not protected by the marine, mar, marine protected areas or the marine special planning. This is a huge problem. Or in other words, we need to expand our policies to protect this kind of marginal reefs. The next, Paulo, please. Can you see the, the Rio? No, 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 no. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, I'm seeing here. Not no, with I, you? I'm not seeing this, this slide. Where is your slide? Where is this slide and, for and, you? Uh, on the article of, of Science of Total Environment. Now we are in the gate, in the gate 305, not for you? Yes, 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 the next slide. Now, now, okay, now, okay, please, the next, next one. Okay. So, I would like to finish uh, my presentation on, on, on a idea, on an idea, saying an idea that I published in this article alone. <laughs> Hi, please, the next slide, you follow. <laughs> I felt like this guy alone against all woods to publish this, this article alone. <laughs> Please, the next slide. The marginal reefs have one situation that is, uh, I call it a, a marginal reef paradox. The cost of surviving in an extreme environment is lower diversity and also a limited three-dimensional structure. And we have resistant species. For example, resistant species to, 
to bleaching or to heat, heat waves, for example, the warming. But these species evolved to, sub, to specific suboptimal conditions, such as higher temperatures or higher turbidity, but not to all disturbance. This is important to understand. For example, we have a species that is adapted to temperature, but if we have a higher sedimentation levels, that, that species will suffer uh, many problems, for example, diseases or higher mortality rates. And these reefs have a, a problem because they usually have low ecological redundance. And we have extreme environments. And these environments, of course, live very near the upper threshold. Or in other, or in other words, we found vulnerable reef systems. This is the paradox. We have some X species that are resistant, but the system uh, as a whole is a vu very vulnerable to fast changing environmental conditions. Uh, the next, Paulo. And this is the explanation about the resilience, the res res resilience to global changes. The next one, please, Paulo. In this slide, we can see, okay, uh, the situation. For example, we have marginal reefs in distinct places around the world under cumulative human pressure. For example, the places with red color or the orange color. The, the areas under a uh, higher human pressure. And unfortunately, this kind of ecosystems that is vulnerable are under uh, intense human pressure, okay? So in this case, we need to think more about this kind of ecosystems. Please, Paul, the next one. So this kind of ecosystems is vulnerable. For example, I will give some examples very fast. For example, a mass bleaching of corals in a light, high latitude in Australia. Next, Paulo. Heat waves as a major tr threat to tube the coral reefs in Brazil. Next one, Paulo. I'm not the only one to think that these kind of marginal reefs are not climate change refuge. For example, mesophotic coral ecosystems are also treated. The next one, Paulo. And interesting, these hot reefs in the Persian Arabian Gulf, we think that this kind of reef is more resistant, but we need, we see on the recent results of this uh, book chapter for the professor John Burt. Uh, one very interesting result. Please, the next one, Paulo. See this result on the abstract. We have problems even with this kind of system. Okay, and the next one, then the uh, final. Okay, perfect, the next. So, I, uh, uh, the, the past, the past slide, please, Paulo, not this. Yes, so this is the final slide, okay, to, we, we need to think. Marginal coral reefs as climate change refuge. It's a kind of overselling. This is the, the question that I leave to the participants. So I talk too much, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity and I'm very happy to be here. And now we go to the next talk. Thank you, Professor Paulo. Thank you, Marcelo, it was great, man. A lot of brainstorm here in my mind. My brain is burning. Guys, uh, please again, put your brain to work, check your questions and let's try to to present more information uh, we are organizing all the questions professor sergio carolina presented many questions so uh we have questions already but please more and more just because when we end all the presentations then we will run all the discussions uh, all together so giovanna who's the next 
I guess now is Professor Luis Kotovic. Luis, are you ready? I guess Luis. Luis, are you with us? <laughs> yes, I'm <not> sorry. <laughs> uh, well, while Luis is, is, is uploading uh, your presentation, Luis, just to yes. advertise, we, will, we are having some problems with the transmission in Portuguese. So if you are in the channel in Portuguese, uh, please, you can, of course, stay there, but move to the link that we uh, explained in the chat there. So please pay attention. We have an access to that to to you to be directly in the in the room of uh, translation. Okay. Paulo. Paulo. Yes. Sorry. I can listen to you, Giorgio. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, when I'm expected to talk. Well, you you will be the next. Right after then, we... oh, If you have problem with time, we can change. <laughs> Up to Luis, of course. For me, well, for me, it's okay. If you, if you want to change for me, it's okay. We can change, yes. No, no, no. I have only, I mean, I will have problems in, in, in one hour, but I think that we will more or less be in time. Uh, at uh, half past four Italian time, so... Uh, É, é porque eu tô, eu tô seguindo o programa aqui, né? É, infelizmente, eu tenho outros compromissos depois é, com outro projeto, então eu vou ter que ir embora de... Não, não se preocupe, é, por favor, por, é, obrigado por estar aqui e por ter falado. Por favor, então você... É, a palavra é sua. Posso introduzir o Jorge, por favor? Enquanto o Jorge está se arrumando, por favor, apresente -o. Ok. O doutor Jorge Montinelli, Montinelli é um cientista italiano que tem um PhD em ecologia da Universidade de Parma. Ele é pesquisador sênior da Universidade de Salento, igual ao professor Sérgio Rossi, e ele pesquisa as teias alimentares marinhas, focando na avaliação da, do impacto ecológico de crustáceos invasores, e ele também é o editor do Plus One, é, Relatórios Científicos e da Ciência Mediterrânea. Muito obrigado. Você consegue ver os slides? Está funcionando? Sim, mas não está na tela cheia. Certo, então. E agora? Mudou? Não. E agora? Nós conseguimos ver a apresentação, mas ainda não está em tela cheia. Ele não, não está mudando a tela? Está no está no modo de PowerPoint. Ainda não conseguimos a tela cheia. Jorge, eu tenho essa apresentação comigo. Se você quiser, eu posso transmiti-la. Eu vou tentar mais uma vez. E se eu não conseguir, você 
coloco a minha apresentação, então. Obrigada. PowerPoint mode, uh, we can't see the, 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 the full screen yet. Unfortunately. Uh, Giorgio, I have your presentation with me. If you want, I can. Yeah, uh, one last try and then you will. Okay. You will take the floor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. And... Okay. What's it going on? Okay, now it should work. No, yeah. it, it stays, it, it's freezed, I don't know. So, Paolo, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think the, 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 the thunderstorm of yesterday disturbed all of us. <laughs> And also the internet here in South of Brazil. Ah, but at, at the very end it moves. It's, it's only extremely slow. Sorry. Ah, I think that at is the, the problem. End, it moves. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so please. Do you want to try one again? Last, yes, oh, one last oh. try. Sorry. Sorry okay, for, no for being so problematic. Okay. So try again. Okay. Okay, it works. But it does not present. Interesting. Well, okay. it's moving for us, but it's not in the full presentation mode. Can you see it? Yeah, but uh, we are okay. If you prefer like that, we are seeing you. You see the first bar. I don't know why it does not enter the full presentation mode. I don't know. <laughs> but if you prefer, if you prefer, present yourself like that. For me, it's fine. Just uh, amplify okay, a little bit floor. more. Okay, okay. You have the you have my slides. Please start yes. on your side. Okay, so okay, let's do it. Is ready here. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. So. Yes. So. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. This is an extremely interesting and stimulating, stimulating aspects for me. Uh, I'm actually working on something uh, on. Um, please, Paula, next one. On a, in a completely different field. The outline of my presentation is quite simple. I will make some general consideration on marine animal forests. Uh, extremely incomplete and please, please excuse my ignorance uh, in the field. Uh, I'm hiding some open issue that in my opinion should be addressed somehow uh, in the future studies on marine animal forests. And I will conclude, but the, the main body of my presentation will be focused on, on the use of stable isotopes in ecological studies and specifically for the study of uh, functions in marine animal forests. Next one, please. Some definitions. Uh, at the cost of repeating what has been already said and mentioned, uh, our bent marine animal forests are communities dominated by uh, suicide suspension feeders. Uh, these species are habitat forming. In, in other terms, they are ecological engineers and they are able to change the local biotic and abiotic conditions in terms of light, currents, food availability, or why not the suspended sediment. All in all, they generate like a forest, like a tree forest, a three-dimensional architecture, uh, whose size, whose dimension uh, can range from a few centimeters to meters. Uh, 
Moving from these general considerations and definitions, I simply want to highlight uh, some extremely important functions that uh, MAFs uh, actually uh, have. They do enhance the structural complexity and heterogeneity of the habitats where they occur. They promote local biodiversity, even though they are often dominated by a few species in general, the general effect on biodiversity is uh, positive. And last but not least, they control and modulate the availability of resources uh, beside themselves to other species occurring in the forest. Next one. Uh, only a few examples uh covering i have grabbed photographs from every <laughs> sources that sergio kindly provided to me so this is this is only a, a, an incomplete uh set e aqui temos alguns exemplos peculiares nas profundidades do oceano Chegando na planície abissal, é, representado pelos montes marinhos e os campos de nódulos, e também eventos é, térmicos. Então, dentro dessa definição de florestas de animais marinhos, você consegue achar muitos diferentes, comunidades muito diferentes localizados em diferentes áreas, em diferentes profundidades. E sempre compartilhando as mesmas características. Eles criam novos habitats, eles, eles agregam biomassa, eles mudam as condições de biodiversidade do habitat ao redor. Desculpa, é, tá. Eu tentei aqui resumir usando alguns exemplos de florestas de animais. Então, indo dos recifes mais superficiais aos bancos de ostras, indo até as planícies abissais e os. Sorry, there's been... So I, I made an attempt to summarize uh, only using some, some examples uh, of marine animal forests. So shifting from tropical coral reefs to oyster reefs, to cold water coral reefs, down to uh, the abyssal plains and hydrothermal vents, and find some general uh general uh variations in what may be abiotic conditions like temperature light also from the point of view of the functions of the main functions that you that characterize the the the, 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 the forests you are considering so moving from autotrophy to complete heterotrophy with an extreme uh, exception chemotrophy and hydrothermal events. Next one, Greg. thank you. Oh. Have, sorry, I guess Paulo is off. No, he's here. I don't know what happened. Paulo, can you hear us? Sorry, guys, I, I, I dropped here. <laughs> 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 I lost my connection. Uh, I was here and in one second I was anymore. I wasn't anymore. Okay, let me, let's start. Sorry, guys. Let's start again. Today's another hard day for all of us. <laughs> Are you okay, so, Sergio? Yeah, Sergio, I'm okay. Is fine? The, Perfect. Is this right? Is this right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
only, I mean, to get into the detail of what the conclusion of what I was mentioning. So, uh, in terms of functioning, you may actually observe a, a, a gradient as long as I'm generalizing and uh, I'm simplifying what is absolutely complex. But in practical terms, you may observe depending on on the availability of light and accordingly uh, related with death, a shift from autotrophy to heterotrophy, um, a, a, a specific aspect, an extremely interesting aspect is that as long as you have shallow water uh, forests, you have autotrophy dominating uh, also because of uh, of the evolutionary and morphological adaptations that the whole communities uh, have experienced and to the development of a, 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 a symbiotic interactions with, with uh, uh, primary producers. Obviously, as long as you increase the depth, light uh, fades, Heterotrophy dominates, but as long as you reach hydrothermal vents, you have again uh, 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 the autotrophy in terms of chem autotrophy. So chemical compounds like Vincent and so on can be used by primary producers. Next one. Uh, this is a sort of a uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, 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 it's, a question, it's a silly question. Uh, what about trophic complexity? De uma forma é, troficamente simples, um, outra generalização é que as florestas de animais marinhos são sumidouros de carbono, mas O resto da apresentação vai mostrar mais aspectos dessa, dessa questão aqui dos sumidouros. Mas, do ponto de vista prático, se nós considerarmos apenas os organismos que se alimentam de suspensão, nós conseguimos ver que, se entrarmos nos detalhes das dimensões, do que é filtrado pelas esponjas, é, poliquetos, etc., você vê que há uma mudança. Então, mesmo se considerarmos sempre os mesmos alimentos, você vai encontrar uma variação incrível em termos do tamanho da, do alimento que é ingerido. Mas isso é apenas um exemplo. Vamos continuar? Então, voltando aos exemplos que eu mostrei no começo da apresentação, a, a pergunta geral que surge é, há um padrão geral é, que conecta, ou uma regra geral que pode ser identificada ou enfatizada, que associa a complexidade do habitat formado pelas pelas florestas de animais marinhos, as, a biodiversidade que caracteriza essas florestas e como eles funcionam em termos de, de transferência de energia de nutrientes. A segunda pergunta, quais ferramentas podemos usar para estudar a transferência e o fluxo de energia e nutrientes, não apenas o carbono, mas outros, outros nutrientes nessas florestas. É, é, apesar de estarmos focando nesses nos corais e, e habitats específicos, é, existem, será que existem ferramentas gerais? para todos os ecossistemas. E a terceira pergunta é qual a contribuição das interações simbióticas para regular a matéria e a energia nessas florestas? Próximo slide. 
Bem, isso aqui é um bom assunto para um artigo de revisão. Eu fiz uma meta-análise de todos os estudos que já foram realizados no passado usando os isótopos estáveis nessas florestas. Eu preciso admitir que é, que encontrei alguns problemas, pois esse termo de é, floresta de animais marinhos é um termo que tem sido mais usado nos últimos cinco anos. Of all the studies that have been performed in the past using stable isotopes uh, on marine animal forests, I have to admit there are I've encountered some problems because marine animal forests, as a term, is in use only let's say, since the last five years, please correct me. So you need to get into the detail of each typology. So repeat your search. And what you may find is that there is a great heterogeneity in the use of stable isotopes in, 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 uh, uh, for the study of marine animal forests. The last one and the most appealing, at least, Uh, for me is the one that is shown in the in the slide uh, if you manage to highlight the the graph it, please go on okay uh, this is what has been found in a hydrothermal vent in the community in the in, in an animal forest characterizing an a hydrothermal vent uh, I will get into the details of what is shown in, in, in the graph, but in practical terms, what I found extremely appealing was that using stable isotopes, the analysis of stable isotopes, uh, the authors were able to identify quite a huge set of different fun trophofunctional groups within the community. So what it may be considered as extremely simple, as a matter of fact, it is not. And this is the example with the hydrothermal uh, vent from the Gulf of Guinea, but uh, there are many other examples with oyster reefs, uh, even coral reefs, a little bit less, and so on. So let's get into the detail of the, of the method. Some definitions again. So isotopes are atoms with uh, of the same element, uh, but with different so with the same number of protons, but with a different number of neutrons. Specifically in ecology, uh, stable isotopes are used, so they do not undergo radioactive decay and. Uh, please go on. Even though almost any element has got uh, stable isotopes, uh, in practical terms, the most uh, popular uh, uh, in ecology are carbon and nitrogen, and to a lesser extent, sulfur. But I will get back to this later on. Please go on. Well, in practical terms, uh, if you want to measure the concentration of different uh, stable isotopes of the same element in a, in a sample, all you have to do, this is a, a, a general, a simplified diagram uh, uh, of, a, of a mass spectrometer. All you have to do, all in all, is to burn your sample, transform it into a gaseous form, And using a carrier, in gen generally, I mean, in general, it's helium. Well, you uh, separate within a, a, a magnetic field the different uh, the different isotopes of the element. Uh, this is to say that uh, even though extremely similar, only differing by one neutron and or, or two at last, 
Well, they do behave under certain conditions, they do behave differently. This is the basis of the, of the, tech, of the methodology. But if, please go to the next one, please. Um, yeah, maybe I, I've shifted something. Uh, could, could you please get back? No, 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 no. So, no problems. Let's go on. Next one. Ah, uh, okay. So, no, too much. I think we have this delay from Italy and the south of Brazil. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they do behave differently in a magnetic field, but most importantly, they do behave differently in the environment. This is a classical example with uh, water. Depending on the fact that you have the lighter or the heavier isotope, uh, you have a different be chemical, be a biophysical, uh, sorry, chemical physical behavior of the molecule. Please go on. Uh, and uh, uh, no, there, there are some, sorry, but there are some shifts in the, ah, okay. Thanks. Uh, in the biota, uh, isotopes uh, are characterized by the phenomenon of fractionation. So a relative partitioning of the heavier and lighter isotope between uh, different phases in a, in a system. In practice, you have a change in the ratio of uh, carbon isotopes, nitrogen isotopes, as they move along uh, a food chain or throughout an, uh, an environment. Uh, the fractionation value of factor uh, identified in terms of delta, delta values, is simply estimated by uh, the difference of what you measure in terms of uh, uh, isotopic ratio in the consumer and its source. The mechanism, the underlying mechanism are today still uh, under consideration. I mean, it's not totally clear how it works, the whole story, but what is clear is that as long as you have uh, a series of physiological uh, processes, in particular excretion, you have a preference for uh, isotopically light uh, isotopes. So ex on the other hand, assimilation and fixation and in, 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 um, uh, in uh, uh, tissues preferentially uh, determine an increase in the heavier isotope. Next one, please. So, okay. yeah, so for nitrogen in general, you observe a fractionation value between 3.2 and 3.4 per mil. For carbon, you don't have, uh, you don't have this, let's say, general uh, response uh, that are more heterogeneous, but in general, Carbon is considered to be extremely conservative in terms of fractionation. So uh, the general value that is in use is between zero and dot 0.5. Accordingly, uh, the isotopes of nitrogen can be used to investigate the trophic structure of a community or an assemblage, while carbon isotopes, they do uh, highlight which are the sources of carbon. In conclusion, we have a, 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 an example of 
how it can be used fractionation for example for calculating the traffic position of a consumer uh comparing the the consumer the the, the signature of the consumer itself with a baseline and considering the fractionation of 3.4 plus uh the trophic level of the baseline species that you have in use so one if you have a primary producer two if it is a primary consumer and so on next one have a look at the developments uh uh, the first and most important and most popular today is represented by mixing models. So the possibility of using the signature of uh, a consumer together with those of the resources to identify the different contribution of the uh, resources to the diet of the consumer itself. Basically, from a mathematical point of view, uh, we are dealing with a combination of, of uh, with a linear combination of the isotopic signature of the, of the resources corrected by fractionation. Uh, everything works fine when you have two resources and two isotopes, as long as you have more resources, you still have the possibility of calculating uh, the contributions, no more in terms of exact values, but in, part in terms of uh, probability, or uh, next one, please, of, um, yes, possible contributions, sorry. Uh, one one extremely interesting aspect is that using uh, um, mixing models you can also calculate fluxes in particular fluxes of carbon and these are the most advanced uh, approaches uh, using mixing models and stabilized loops next one what about symbiosis this is a, 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 a general sketch of different of the different typologies of symbiotic interaction that we may find, uh, from chemosynthetic to mananotrophic to and uh, nitrogen fixing symbiosis to photosynthetic symbiosis. Again, stable isotopes also in this case can be extremely useful in highlighting which are the underlying mechanisms and the underlying typologies of symbiosis acting within your system. Next one, please. Uh, the only point is that as long as you consider a trophic interaction, you have fractionation, a classical, classically between 3.4, 3.2, with uh, with symbiosis, uh, the 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 whole process becomes a little bit more complicated. You have um, a continuous recycling of the of the elements between the symbiont and the host, and this can be taken into consideration. Um, next one, please. Uh, I, I really like this paper, it's extremely interesting, and it's, it's focused on the interaction between a dinoflagellate and a gorgon and a gorgonian uh, host, and a comparison between a temperate and a tropical system. Using stable isotopes, the others were able to identify the contribution and to assess the contribution of organic nutrients uh, available in the water column in temperate system, while on the other hand, the contribution of uh, nitrogen fixation to uh, in the tropical system. Next one. To conclude, uh, and to increase the resolution 
of the output of, 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 of a stable isotope analysis, please consider that currently research is focusing on two different aspects. The first one is to enlarge, to widen the, the set of elements of which we may analyze the isotopic uh, behavior in a system. So beside carbon and nitrogen, and to a minor extent sulfur, also hydrogen and oxygen. The other aspect is uh, uh, the, the analysis of compound specific um, um, biological macromolecules uh, like fatty acids and amino acids. Next one. With the use of hydrogen and oxygen, this is quite a promising field. There are several problems related with the fact that hydrogen and oxygen are not, uh, well, they are transferred along the food chain by means of trophic interactions, but they are also assimilate, assimilated, they are also have um, enter into an organism with water. So an effort must be taken to take into consideration different sources, uh, including environmental water. Next one. Uh, with uh, biological, uh, with compound specific stable isotope analysis, uh, in general, from a practical point of view, you have a coupling between uh, the mass spectrometer for isotopic analysis with a gas chromatographer or a liquid chromatographer. Able to the last, uh, the last, uh, to able to separate the different compounds, so amino acids from lipids to monosaccharides and so on. On each of these. Compounds, stable isotopes can be analyzed. And uh, please, next one. Providing an extended resolution of the information uh, that you may obtain using stable isotopes. You simply enlarge the, the set of, of uh, uh, markers, in this case, chemical markers, that can be uh, adopted to uh, resolve trophic interactions, including symbiotic interactions. Next one. Well, with amino acids, uh, more or less the, 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 the same, same rule applies. Uh, amino acids, analysis of uh, the isotopes in amino acids uh, enable a researcher to differentiate, to differentiate the isotopic signature between trophic amino acids and source amino acids. Among the first one, we have glutamic acids, acid, and uh, for the source amino acids, in particular, phenylalanine is uh, in use. Yes, and uh, the comparison of the next one, please. The comparison of the concentration and the isotopic signature of the two uh, typologies of amino acids enables uh, um, the estimation of, a, uh, of trophic position of a consumer without the need of using a baseline species as a comparison. Next one. To conclude. And this is uh, unfortunately not for a marine animal forest. This is a quite uh, interesting example, extremely re recent example of uh, a, 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 a High, highly resolved food web uh, that has been uh, a resolution that has been possible thanks to the use of amino acids and compound specific uh, stable isotope analysis.
Next one. I think we are. Uh, yeah. Also, I mean, with carbon, with the analysis of uh, stable isotopes, carbon uh, isotopes, uh, we have a little bit more uh, complicated picture. Um, it is not completely clear up to now how to use essential amino acids and non-essential non amino acids for uh, increasing the resolution of the analysis. Um, even though there is an emerging technique based on the compound specific analysis of the isotopes of hydrogen. And this is a paper published maybe one month ago. I think we are, we are concluding. Next one. Yes. Only a few words to conclude. Uh, the extreme complexity of marine animal forests, complexity in terms of uh, obviously uh, the, 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 the species occurring in the assemblage, the functions and the relationship occurring among these species and how uh, nutrients and energy flow across the different species necessitates a tool, a unifying tool, and in this respect, stable isotopes may provide, and with all the different, uh, together with mixing model and compound specific analysis and so on, may provide a useful tool. My conclusion is that as any other uh, tool and technique in science, it necessitates to be supported by conventional, by alternative approaches. It ca they can provide extremely uh, clarifying answers, but not complete. So uh, that's it. They are useful, but then they need to be backed up by additional approaches. Thank you so much. Thank you, Giorgio. It was a really very interesting, well, well so something that moved with our brains a lot. So, uh, as Giorgio need to leave us, uh, please, Giorgio, keep, stay with us. Because I think is 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 better you provide some answers maybe for one question is it possible? Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind, so Sergio is asking. Oh, Sergio. Yeah, yeah. You are seeing the the question. Uh, some deep sponges have fifteen <laughs> nitrogen. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, Wait, wait, let's start. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you so much, Sergio. Uh, okay, it depends. I mean, I cannot tell you, I mean, if you say, okay, you have 13, 18 per mil in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of um, uh, nitrogen. It depends, it depends which is the uh, signature of the origin of the nitrogen okay it depends on the source so this is an extremely interesting aspect i obviously i don't have an answer uh, all i can say that maybe the the food of the sponge so what they filter have uh, an isotopic signature of nitrogen more or less close to 13, 18, minus 3.2 or 3.4. But that's it. The other one is, uh, uh, what else? Very interesting, sempre Sergio. Yeah, this is yeah. one approach that will clarify many trophic relationships and yeah. carbon nitrogen but fluxes. Please let me emphasize again the fact that, okay, I'm a trophic ecologist, so for me it's okay. Yes, 
they are extremely useful for clarifying trophic trophic relationships. Thanks to this, I mean, this, this involvement, I had the chance to read finally a lot of literature of symbi symbiotic interactions and how they can be studied using stable isotopes and uh, 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 I, uh, a new world uh, opened to me. Uh, I'm no expert in symbiotic interactions and, uh, but there, uh, this is a, a, a really stimulating field in which stable isotopes and compound specific analysis can really provide a contribution. Yeah. Last but not least, using mixing models, it is possible to assess and quantify fluxes, fluxes of carbon. And this is only to get back to what has been already said and mentioned, but this is not an alternative. It could be a technique and an approach going side by side with other approaches, other uh, methodologies, providing complementary and why not clarifying information of, uh, of what is going on in an assemblage. Last, you can use these approaches no matter if you are studying a coral reef, an oyster reef, or an hydrothermal vent. You always have an isotopic biplot, and no matter how many isotopes you analyze, the, the final output and the methods are always the same. So you may imagine something uh, encompassing a huge array of systems always using the same approach and answering okay. to the same questions. Okay, thank you, thank you Giorgio. It was really very interesting. So let's move. Luis, come with us. Giorgio, thank you very much again. If you can stay, we'll be really very welcome for yeah, the next half hour. I will hour stay, bonus. but for only for a uh, quarter of an hour. Sorry. Okay, no worries, no worries. Thank you very much for coming. So let's do uh -huh. it. Luis, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, and of course, cool. excuse me, Giovanna, please, the introduction. Ah, and thank you, Luis, for for this shift. Thank you again. No, it's okay. You are welcome. Okay, bye. Bye. So, Luis. Dr. Luis Kotovic is an oceanographer and obtained his PhD in environmental geochemistry in Federal University of uh, Fluminense and the University of Bordeaux. In Brazil, Luiz teaches at the Federal University of Ceará and dedicates his research uh, on carbon cycling and biogeochemical process in aquatic ecosystems, including estuaries, mangroves, coral reefs, and continental shelf waters. The main research themes include greenhouse gas atmospheric exchanges, ecosystem metabolism, eutrophication, coastal and ocean acidification, and blue carbon. So you can take the word. Okay, thank you, Giovanna. Can you list me well? Yes. Okay, and the uh, the presentation is is on the the screen. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, let's go. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you uh, for this invitation to present some some ideas about uh, this stem. Uh, special thanks to Sergio Rossi that uh, who invited me and suggested this stem source coral reef source or sinks of atmospheric CO two. Uh, it's uh, just a specific question, but it's really complex question. Then I have constructed this presentation to try to answer this question and some some different point of view, I guess, than uh, other presentations have shown here, but let's go. Um, first of all, I present this graph showing the dramatic increase of atmospheric CO2, despite the recent efforts to reduce the emissions, the emissions are growing and growing even after the pandemic period. 
Then we have this, this scenario of increased atmospheric concentrations. And, uh, and how big is this problem? This problem is really, really big because look at this graph showing the concentration of atmospheric CO2 for the past 3 million of years. Here we have the concentrations. And now, currently, you have one concentration that is higher than the past 3 million of years. And the problem is that this increase of CO2 is synchronous with the changes in temperature, which means that higher concentrations of CO2 are related to high temperatures. And uh, we don't know exactly how the climate change, uh, the climate system and how the, the, the Earth system will answer to this concentration that is above uh compared to the past three millions of years and of course now you are in the anthropocene the human population and its role as a geological force we don't know exactly when it start the anthropocene but in fact you are in the anthropocene um the last ipcc report showed that from comparing to the pre-industrial period to the uh, current uh, uh, period we have one degree of increase in average temperature in the Earth system. And you know that uh, the carbon dioxide is the main contributor for this uh, global warming. Then it's important to understand the source and sinks of this gas to, to manage this, this, uh, this threat. And it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land. Of course, the carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. However, uh, more recently, from the 90 years, uh, they also attempted that the atmospheric increase of CO2 is followed by a seawater increase. For example, this graph shows in red points the atmospheric increase of carbon dioxide, and in blue, the seawater increase of carbon dioxide, then they are really correlated. And if you have an increase in the concentration of CO2, you have a decrease of seawater pH and a decrease of the concentrations of carbonate ion. This means that these changes in carbonate chemistry are related to the ocean acidification that is the other problem of, of CO2, because the first problem, the classical pro problem, is the global warming, the climate change. But now we, we know that the increase of CO2 is also related to, to the ocean acidification and the calcifying organisms like coral reefs, uh, coccolithophorids, among the others, will be particularly affected. And of course, is driven by human uh, caused uh, CO2 emissions. And to understand what is happening with the carbon cycle, it's important uh, to, to look for the human anthropogenic perturbation on the global carbon cycle. For example, here we have the, this, these settings provide the fluxes and the circles uh, represent the reservoirs. Then we have, the, for example, the uh, land use change and mainly the uh, burning of fossil fuels are producing CO2 and emitting to the atmosphere at 9.4 pentagrams of carbon per year. This is the global carbon budget that is published each year. Then we have that one great part of these uh, emissions are accumulating in the atmosphere and one part is uptaken by the vegetation and one part is also uptaken by the oceans. Then. Uh, this uptake by the oceans is related to the uh, ocean acidification. However, look that the among in the land the ocean interface, we don't know exactly what is happening because we have just few data and we don't know what is happening here. Then it's important to look, for example, and compare the open ocean with the continental shelf and history in terms of surface area. For example, look this. Uh, the, the open ocean have a great uh, higher surface area compared to continental shelves and estuaries. However, if you look to the CO2 fluxes at the air-water interface, we know that the, the 
continental shelves and estuaries have a disproportional hold on the carbon cycle. The negative values represent a sink, then the oceans are a sink, continental shelves are sink, and estuaries are source. Of course, this represents uh, average values, but we, we know that in reality, we have very large difference uh, considering different areas in oceans, continental shelves, and estuaries. To look uh, a little more about the carbon cycle, we need to understand a little bit the marine carbonate system, that because this uh, explains uh, the, the, the fluxes of CO2 of the air water interface and in, among other important considerations. For example, here we have the, the atmospheric CO2 né, when they uh, enter in the ocean at the air water interface, they have the uh, soft hydration with reacts with the water, producing the carbonic acid, this carbonic acid sulfur dissociation, forming the bicarbonate and forming a hydrogen ion. And after this bicarbonate can suffer dissociation, form the carbonate ion and also the hydrogen uh, ion. Look that uh, these reactions are in equilibrium. We have the bidirectional as, uh, ways for example you can go in this way and you can go in this way then more co2 entering the water we have more hydrogen ion forming and you have the low ph with more co2 entering the water other important uh, things of this graph are the dic the dissolved inorganic carbon that represents the co2 plus the bicarbonate plus the carbonate this represented the dic the total inorganic carbon and you have also the total alkalinity that represents the carbonate, the carbonate and other ions, but they, these two are the most important. And of course, the CO2 is related to the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere and in the water. All these equations are related. And if you have uh, a perturbation in one of these parts of the reactions, you will have influence in the other parts then we need to understand what is happening with this, uh, these equations to answer about the air water CO2 exchange and uh, what is the role as a source or sink. For this, we need to understand also the biological pumps. What is the biological pump? You have the organic carbon pump, that is the uptake of CO2 by the phytoplankton and after the distribution along the uh, the trophic levels look that the phytoplankton transform the co2 and in organic matter in particulated and dissolved organic matter and of course when just a little part of this uh, organic carbon format will be you will be uh, sinking in the co ocean floor of course you have areas of uh, 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 in the oceans, for example, that they are source of CO2, but a net uh, metabolism indicated that the oceans are net sink, sink of CO2. Then the equation is uh, from the left to the right, because we have the net uh, organic metabolism is a net sink of CO2. However, we have the lime counter pump, the carbonate counter pump, that is represented by this reaction that uh, is formed with one um, uh, ion of calcium with two molecules of bicarbonate forming the calcium carbonate, but and producing CO2. This is really important. This is what you call the counter pump because when you have the calcification, this reaction involves the calcification, represent the calcification, you have a produce of CO2. Then, for example, in coral reefs, we have this reaction yeah, because you have the formation of calcium carbonate substrate. Then you have a production of CO2. Of course, you have this uh, uptake of DIC in the form of bicarbonate. However, the production of CO2 
also involves unconsumed of alkalinity because this is this represents also the alkalinity. If you load the alkalinity, we have the low buffering capacity. If you have the low buffering capacity, we have less capacity to hold more CO2 in the water. And this is really important when thinking about the whole of ecosystems as source or sinks of CO2. For example, you need to consider in on coral reef or other ecosystem, you need to consider the organic carbon pump and the carbonate counter pump because the organic carbon pump is that the uptake of CO2 forming organic matter. And the carbonate counter pump is uh, the formation of uh, calcium carbonate. Né? This equation, if you go to the right position, we have the formation. If you go to the left position, we have the dissolution then you can have the two two uh, ways here of course you can have the two ways on formation of organic matter or on respiration of organic matter and formation of co2 then this the budget between these two process uh answer to this question if they are sinks or source of co2 and of course we can calculate the rain ratio that represents the calcium carbonate the relation between calcium carbonate in the form of particulate PIC, particulate inorganic carbon, and POC, the particulate organic carbon. This will uh, tell a lot about the ecosystem. And about the coral reefs, what is the what are the dominant metabolic process on coral reefs? Then we have the organic metabolic pulse that is represented by photosynthesis and respiration. And you have the inorganic metabolic pulse that represents the calcification and dissolution. The NCP, that is the net community production, is represented by this reaction. And the NCC, the net community calcification, is represented by this reaction. Look that we have the change of DIC in this uh, this side and this side we have the change in DIC and in TA in total alkalinity. Then overall the coral reefs represent the NCP close to zero or a little bit positive, a little uh, positive values indicating that they are autotrophic or this ecosystem is in balance. However, the NCC are almost always positive. Then when you compare the NCP with the NCC. Normally, you have more uh, amount of carbon being uh, formed by NCC, which means that they produce CO2 in the water. For example, here we have the NAC, this is the net ecosystem calcification or net community calcification, it's just a chronic difference. And here we have the NEP or NCP. For example, look at this data for net community calcification, they are always positive. Uh, and readily below zero. However, for NCP, we have positive and negative values because the, during the daylight here in this part, daylight, we have the production of organic matter, a consume of CO2, and after during the night, we have the respiration of organic matter and uh, a formation of CO2. Then is close to zero this budget but here for ncc is almost always positive for this that overall we find uh, positive values and high co2 concentrations in coral reefs for example look at this graph show the relationship between ta the total alkalinity and dic the solar inorganic carbon and here we have the main reactions that occur in coral reefs. We can have the dissolution, calcification, photosynthesis, and respiration. Let's look at the calcification. We have here the, the seawater after this, the calcification start, the TA start to decrease, and the DIC decrease too. But look, this color bar represents the pH. When you have the calcification, your pH tends to decrease. If the pH decrease, you have an increase of CO2. This is the point because you have also a, a loss of alkalinity. Then you have the lower buffering capacity when you lose alkalinity, and the calcification turn the pH lower and turn the CO2 higher. 
And of course, the photosynthesis can, gain, can go to this side. Then during the day, we have an increase of pH. Look at this graph for the blue. And during the night, we have the respiration. Then the metabolical process are going in this, this shift for the left, for the right. But in coral reefs, in healthy coral reefs, we have more calcification than the solution. Then the reaction is goes in this way. Well, after this uh, brief explanation about the metabolic process, let, let's look a little bit about uh, some historical data about this and some historical debate about the coral reefs as source or things. This was the first paper published at the beginning of the 90 years about the coral reefs as source or sinks of atmospheric CO2. And they investigated the coral reefs worldwide. And they concluded that the coral reefs are source of CO2 to the atmosphere at this, uh, this range. And this explanation was about the calcium carbonated precipitation is accompanied by the shift of pH, reducing the buffering capacity and releasing CO2. This was the first paper showing this uh, scenario worldwide. After four years uh, uh, later, this paper was published in Science, showing that the coral reefs can be a sink of CO2 because they, these uh, researchers, they made a diurnal measurements of CO2 in corals, and they sh they have showed that the coral can be a sink of CO2 because they found very low values of uh, CO2 in the water below the atmospheric equilibrium. And they conclude that maybe this can be a, a behavior in other reefs. And they then start a, a discussion in the literature showing this. However, uh, this paper was quickly replied by two paper publisher, of course, in Science 2, showing that uh, the conclusion that they found in that uh, coral reefs was based on only one ecosystem that not represent the coral reefs as a whole. And they point several uh, issues related to methodology, methodological aspects like the single station investigation. Uh, then they concluded that maybe uh, the sink uh, value that they found was related to a specific condition of dead reef. And this other reply also showed that the coral reef that was a sink of CO2 was greatly stressed by human activity, especially the increase of organic carbon production, increase of nutrients. Then maybe the sink was related to an increase of human perturbation, increase in the primary productivity real, uh, compared to the, uh, to the uh, CO2 uh, production, for example. Then these two replies uh, were very uh, strong in, in uh, showing that the coral reefs are source. And this, this paper was uh, really uh, contundent because, for example, for a pure reef to be a net CO2 sink, the sediment would have at least 12% of organic matter or 6% of organic carbon in sediments, in dry waste sediments. And coral reefs typically have uh, 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 organic carbon in sediments less than 1%, 1-2%, and well below them is necessary to be a net sink. Uh, after uh, five years later, another paper tried to reopen what they call it the CO2 source sink debate because uh, they they make an uh, appointment and they and criticize about the methodological aspects of calcium carbonate calcification because they say that the pH and the alkalinity method to measure the net community calcification could uh, overestimate the calcification. And if you have the an overestimate of calcification, you have also an overestimate of CO2 production. But again, this paper was replied by this order. And this, this two papers were 
Publishing the Proceedings of Natural Academy of Science of USA. And they uh, provided several lines of evidence of measurements of community metabolism and showed that don't have a problem with the methodological aspects. Then this paper uh, seems to close it or partially close this discussion. Yeah. For example, this original paper was cited 27 times and this reply was cited 160, uh, showing that we don't have a problem with uh, methodological aspects. And for after the, publi the publication of this paper, uh, I could not find, for example, other important discussions about source or sinks of CO2 in coral reefs. And then I, I will show just uh, uh, two study cases showing uh, some studies conducted in coral reefs. The first was, is this paper that was conducted in the Great Barrier Reef that it, they found a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest continuous coral reef system in the world. Yeah. And the system is a source of CO2. It was published uh, uh, just two years ago. And they found uh, important organic matter production, of course, but as a whole, the net calcification was most important and the system was is a source of CO2. The other paper that I would like to show is this paper that we conducted here in Brazil, uh, particularly in uh, on marine protected area close to Fortaleza. Is here the Pedra do Risca do Meio coral reef, and uh, it's a region with very nice coral reefs, and we conducted some measurements in this region. Here we have the boat track. And here, this circle represents this discrete sampling. Then we, we conducted continuous and discrete measurements to investigate it, uh, if the, this region is a source or sink of CO2. You, you have, we have used a semi-autonomous continuous measurement that we, we can measure in real time uh, the fugacity of CO2 or the partial pressure of CO2. And this equipment was... Uh, uh, mounted on board and was developed by Professor Rosane Marins in collaborator with other researchers. Then this is a very nice because you can measure in real time the partial pressure of CO2. And what we found, we found that the, the concentrations and the fugacity of CO2 here in black uh, dot points are above the atmospheric equilibrium. Look, here is the atmospheric equilibrium and the values of CO2 here in black points are well above then. The region is a source of CO2 and look that is not related to the uh, surface temperature. Here in, in green, we have the uh, temperature and in black, we have the CO2. It's not related to temperature, then is related to the biological metabolism of the ecosystem that are producing CO2 instead of Take in a net uh, way, of course. Look here, this graph showing here the triangles represented the, the, the main coral reefs the structures. And here in this color, we have the fugacity of CO2. Look that uh, close to the coral reefs, we have the highest values compared to the other adjacent coastal waters. Yeah. Of course, we have the influence of along shore and cross shelf along shelf and cross shelf transport. But in, in fact, we have more and higher concentrations in regions surrounding the reefs. And why this? After we, we compare the, the total alkalinity with the dissolved inorganic carbon, we plot this in this graph and you can investigate the main process. You, you, increase, you can say here, the coral reef dominated waters in blue and uh, near shore waters in green, you can see that the coral reef dominated waters follow this slope of calcium carbonate precipitation. If you have a calcium carbonate precipitation, we have an increase in CO, of CO2 in sea water. And we have compared these values with offshore waters. For example, we have here 
or study area, and we compare with other studies that perform measurements of CO2 in offshore waters. We compare the FCO, the FCO2 with in situ temperature and not also we normalize it, the values by temperature, because you can, can have an influence of temperature in the values of FCO2. And comparing these two graphs, for example, the coral reef dominated waters with offshore waters, we have always high, higher values of FCO2 in coral reef dominated ecosystem and always above the 400 micro atmospheres that is uh, about the atmospheric concentrations. Then here we have one important thing because this near shore region dominated by coral reefs have higher fluxes and higher concentration of CO2 compared to these offshore waters that have the presence of coral reefs. And we compile some that uh, data of air water CO2 flux in coral reefs worldwide. We, we have found different values of CO2, but almost all studies show positive values indicated that, indicating that these coral reefs are a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Then I, I just think about this question. Are coral reefs blue carbon ecosystem? Of course, we, we, we listened some important talks yesterday, today, Martina, Sergio Rossi, but I, I will show just one, one idea that it's a little bit different. Then what are blue carbon ecosystem? I will not repeat what they they already say, but is uh, the established blue carbon ecosystem are mangrove, tidal marshes, sea grass meadows, and then we have potential blue carbon ecosystems. You have some ecosystems that do not meet the criteria actually at the current uh, time that are coral reefs, fish, and bivalves. Yeah. This was uh, uh, said by this research published in biological letters. Uh, published by two very important researchers on blue carbon research, Catherine Lovelock and Carlos Duarte, and they established some criteria for inclusion of ecosystem as blue carbon ecosystem. For example, the criteria, the scale of greenhouse gas emissions are, uh, they removed or emissions are significant. The long-term storage of fixed CO2 is important. Uh, the management uh, to maintain or to increase or to enhance the carbon stocks and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions are uh, important. For example, they classify the coral reefs. Uh, no, 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 because uh, from several lines of evidence, they, they conclude that coral reefs as uh, habitats to mitigate the climate change are not uh, important at this time. For example, habitats dominated by calcifying organisms contribute to climate change, adaptation, among others, uh, but not for CO2 sink. However, this is important because meets, I think, meet the criteria adopted, for example, for Martina. However, future research on the whole of calcifying organisms in organic matter sequestration. I think this is the point because they produce CO2, but they also maybe have a hope in organic matter sequestration. And this is, you need to compare the, the, the producer CO2 with the organic matter sink. Another important point, I think, is about the connectivity between ecosystems, because this paper showed, for example, that the coral reefs enhance the sea grass meadows blue carbon potential. How? Because, for example, in coral reefs, the presence of coral reefs uh, associated, for example, with seagrass meadows, they can protect the ecosystem for the high energy of waves. Then you have the, the waves arriving, the coral reefs block the, some great energy of the waves, and after we can uh, amplify the sink behavior. And this was they found. They found that the association between the coral reefs with blue carbon can enhance the blue carbon potential. And, this is, I think, is a great uh, uh, way to, to, to study this uh, part. And finally, I present this, uh, this paper that was published this year, showing that global coral reefs 
are exhibiting decline in calcification and increase in primary productivity. Then look at this, they compiled the, uh, some data about the calcification rates, rates and primary productivity. They found significant decrease of calcification and they found significant increase of primary productivity. This decrease of calcification at the end of the century can change the, the coral reefs from calcified to, to net solution environment. And of course, these are driven by many ecosystem changes, for example, the global warming the, uh, and the acidification in addition to the nitro nutrient pollution. Then this is, if you have a, a net metabolical change, maybe we have a change also from CO2 so source to CO2 so sink. Then concluding uh, from the, this presentation is that coral reefs are source of CO2. Of course, we have the coral reefs that are sink, but seems to be uh, particularly uh, few studies compared to the other that say that coral reefs are source. At this time, coral reefs don't have the criteria for inclusion as a blue carbon ecosystem. However, future research on the whole of calcifying organisms in organic matter sequestration could alter this view in the near future. Uh, the association of coral reefs with other ecosystems, as I showed before, can contribute to amplify the sink behavior. Uh, repeatedly and recent studies exhibited decline in calcification and increase organic productivity in coral reefs, then maybe they are experiencing a shift in the metabolic process and you don't know exactly what will happen in the near future. Well, despite not acting as a CO2 sink, coral reefs pro provide other severe and crucial and really important ecosystem service that many talks of this uh, spring school uh, appointed and of course we needed to conserve and etc. Then I think it's this. Thank you very much and let's to the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this was really very interesting. Well, I also work with calcifiers and uh, well, of course, with rhodolites, with coralline red algae, my life is easier because they also are primary producers. So, yeah. <laughs> but yes, well, I, I invite Marcelo Martina to the to our table, and I think we have time for few questions. Have you some few questions selected, Giovanna? I selected some, but. I don't know if we ask separately or to everyone. Yeah, I think we can put in the table and then each of you can maybe pick up some and uh, start. It's because uh, some of the questions were already answered on the chat, but not everyone has the, the view. So, can... Giorgio has left. Um, yeah. Well, can I start? So uh, I, I will start with <laughs> a, a question to Martina. Martina, do you think we have, this is a Sergio Rossi question. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, Martina, do you think we have to account on predation on corals, gorgonians, sponges to calculate the immobilized carbon in the marine animal forests? Well, uh, sure. We should uh, we should take into account the the carbon loss for predation, and uh, this is one of the data that is missing, as well as the carbon in, in invested in reproduction, and um, uh, <clears throat> this is the same problem that we have with uh, with black corals uh, when they fragmented. We um, uh, we don't know which is the fate of that fragment. Huh? It could be predated by other organisms. And the same is when um, a gorgonian is directly predated by uh, crustacea or by nudibranch or by, um, by fishes. So, yes, of course, we should integrate this data on the, our in, um, 
of our, our in our estimation should be great to have this data but at the same time we should know uh, which are the species that directly predate on the, uh, on the gorgonians and uh, how often they predate and uh, uh, which are the species that are most sensitive to predation and so on so it is difficult but it will be great to refine the estimation of course Marcel, Luis, do you want to complement? Or are you fine? So if you are fine, let's move. Uh, well, she don't have fantastic answer, so. <laughs> Great. No, I agree with you. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Nothing to add. Well, uh, Sergio is also saying that Fantastic presentation, Luis. When we talk about marine animal forests, we are focusing uh, our attention to the immobilized carbon in their structures. What do you think? The mobilization question. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, I think it's uh, quite complex to answer this uh, because uh, in my point of view, of course, when you have the production of Calcium carbonate to have release of CO2. This is a geochemistry, you cannot, it's, it's, it's just a stoichiometry. Then uh, I think you need to, to, to understand the whole of calcifying organisms on the organic, organic carbon sequestration, not the inorganic, in my point of view. Because the inorganic carbon immobilization is releasing CO2, then you not mitigate the climate change, you not contribute. To, to decrease CO2 because you are producing CO2. For this, that you have all the, almost all the, the, the calcium carbonate ecosystem, uh, sorry, the coral reefs are source. However, if you understand maybe the whole of calcifying organisms to the immobilization of organic carbon, the organic carbon burial and something like this, I think that this is a good way to follow and maybe introduce and, and compile more studies and include these in blue carbon uh, assertions. I think this is uh, uh, what I think. Of course, we have, for example, uh, uh, other calcifying organisms. I think rhodolite beds, they, they do a lot of primary productivity and maybe are higher than the calcification. The NCP, NCC, then it's not, this is not maybe a... Uh, uh, yeah. The, the the case of the rhodolite bed but the coral reefs what i i look in what i i reading is that they are net source but okay. the immobilization of organic carbon in sediments maybe could be a, a interesting point to advance marcel do you want to add something do you yes i'd like to add because i believe that we are talking about the carbon immobilization on the biomass for example we, of course, this is a short term carbon sequestration in the biomass, but we have the reproduction along the time. And we have, for example, generations succeeding along decades or even centuries, of course, when you have a stable population. And we have organisms that are not uh, so calcifying <laughs> organisms, such as large sponges, even the octocorals. Uh, bryozoans, ascidians, and other symbiotic or not organisms. So, and you, uh, when you think about these distinct organisms, we have a, immobilized, uh, a carbon immobilization in this biomass. And the change, we are changing long living forms and large forms, including to simple and fast generations with a few biomass. So I believe we, we are changing and maybe if we, if we decline this population of these distinctive suspension feeders, we will have more source, of course, of carbon. This may be some idea. Sergio may be explained better or Martina, <laughs> but I believe we have some kind of uh, neglected immobilized carbon or not evaluated immobilized mm. carbon in this biomass. Do you understand? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. Oh, yeah, I think so. I, like an open avenue to understand. <laughs> yeah. It's a complicated balance. Martin, do you want to add some? 
on this discussion? Or or no, can no, we move? Just, just because I have a general question to to end this round table. But please. I think that Marcelo summarized um, um, the, the main point uh, that we have to um, we have to quantify this uh, carbon in uh, um, immobilizing the biomass of the organisms. So uh, this is the point. Uh, they, they are long-lived species, and this biomass is um, is uh, this carbon in the biomass is sequestered for a lot of years. So this is the main point. So. I think it summarized really well. Okay. The Thank you very much. So uh, let me see if we have any additional questions. Congratulations to all. I saying Carolina uh, Borato, uh, uh, Braccio, I'm sorry. Congratulations to all speakers. Question, what about the recent recovery of the ozone layer? We will have an improvement for CO2 concentrations with this. What about the recent recovery? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't know exactly what will happen with the recovery of the ozone layer. Really, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. The, Carolina, this is, uh, for me, is also something new considering CO2 emissions. Well, of course, other gases have relation with the ozone hole, but... Uh, just on one point, just one point, I think that the, emissions of CO2 are continuing to grow in, independent of uh, ozone layer or not, then uh, the, the emissions are increasing, are growing, and the, 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 the our plant is warming, is turning more acidic, then I don't know if the ozone is linked, strongly related to, to this process of CO2 increase and greenhouse gas. Uh, yeah, but Let's investigate about that for this afternoon, maybe, or tomorrow morning, then we yes. can bring some uh, more uh, structured answers, because I also don't have an yeah. uh, answer for it. Uh, but I, I do have one question for all of you. Considering every all your presentations, I think we, we can uh, understand that we have very important environments, marginal ones, or very close to our uh, way of life, and all of that are under threat considering overfishery as as we observe it. Also yesterday, even from Sergio Rossi talk and after, during the afternoon and this morning. So for, especially to the students that will continue with us in the normal uh, course, uh, where is the, the impact or how you see the exploitation of the remaining oil reserves that we have in Brazil, especially in Brazil, because we will start a new bide uh, next next October, October 7. So how you see the exploitation of oil and gas and all the impacts, the direct and indirect impacts that exploitation of oil and gas we have uh, on this scenario of already very threatened uh, environments like the marginal or very shallow coral reef systems. How do you see that? Some of one? And I could start? Yes, please. Okay. Um... I, be, I believe that it's not the right way to do these things. The, the, no, it's not the correct way. So we have now an uh, economy in transition, okay? We need a uh, low carbon economy. This is the truth. It's like a train that you need to buy a ticket, okay? <laughs> and this new train, of course, is the wind farms, the solar energy, the green hydrogen, the blue hydrogen, and other uh, renewable energy energies. And so I understand the, 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 the value of exploitation of oil and gas fields, but it's more important now to invest and apply our knowledge to exploit and do a clean activities. In this case, these other kind of energies. And moreover, we, for example, in Brazil, we have many important tropical environments that we not fully understand the distribution, 
the diversity and other things. So in, if you consider some of law principles, principles such as pre the precautionary principle, okay, we, it's not the right way to exploit these, these areas because we don't know, we don't know the risks and the impacts on these uh, unknown uh, tropical systems. Uh, I believe it's, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a thing to do now <laughs> in, these, in these strange times of high emissions of carbon. <laughs> we already have a lot of problems. Some of you want to compliment the Marcelo comment? No? Uh, but I just uh, agree with Marcelo because we have uh, a lot of problems related to the exploitation, uh, not only to uh, in point of view of carbon emissions, etc., but you have uh, pollution related to maybe accidental oil and uh, uh, a lot of kind of problems we need to to point and to, to address, and maybe I don't know about the environmental licensing of these, these, uh, these blocks, for example. We don't know exactly how this environmental licensing process was conducted to, to, to secure or to, to uh, decrease, for example, the, the damage that potentially can, can, can happen with uh, this exploitation then. Uh, it's it's really complicated at this moment. Yeah. Um, Just because I see that, well, of course, if we exploit more uh, fossil fuel, we will burn more. Of course, what we're gonna do with more oil? <laughs> well, we will burn. And if we burn more in this scenario of warming, well, we will, you know, put more fire uh, in our barbecue, and we will burn the meat. So this is something that for me is unbelievable that we are doing that with our government leading this process. So I think COP26 is a good moment for a huge pressure from uh, all organizations, you know, from Greenpeace to governments, just because I think uh, this is the one of the final moments we have to try to avoid two or more degrees of warm so okay please keep all this information in your mind and uh, let's meet this afternoon i think is is enough for this morning we lost a bit our time table this morning let's try to keep the schedule this afternoon thank you very much marcelo martina and luis please giovanna yes uh just to say that some of the questions were not answered, so we can, I think, uh, gather all the, the, the questions and then pass to the, the speakers and they can answer in some platform or YouTube. Yes, I don't know. perfect. I think we have some, some of the answers was, uh, were written uh, already and mm -hmm. we need to pass to the, the audience there. Uh, and of course, uh, we will have different opportunities to do that. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. And thanks again, the girls that are providing the translation in the other room. So, it was a very interesting, productive and brainstorm morning. Thank you. See you later. See Bye. you in one hour more or less. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao.